connecting with country framework is really built on the foundation of partnership with community and really empowering voices throughout all phases, but then also into the future, the implementation of these decisions. What does it look like for First Nations people to be deeply embedded into these environments, into the future? Now, that can be through a range of things in terms of the way that people move through country, the uses of different country, the design of buildings, but then also how are First Nations people employed? How are we making sure that they have housing in these places, that their communities can continue to live in these places into the future? Because with a lot of these big planning projects, a lot of First Nations people are kind of locked out into being there in the future. And so for me, it's not just about the visual representation and a very embedded response to that, but it's also about seeing Aboriginal people in these places in the future and what that really looks like and feels like. Hi, Smart Community friends. In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I have a wonderful conversation with Ellie Davison. Ellie is a Ballangara woman from the East Kimberley and also a descendant of Captain William Bly, so often describes herself as being caught in the crosswinds of Australia's history. With a passion to empower the voices of First Nations people, Ellie combines her town planning and Indigenous engagement qualifications to shape our places and spaces. In this episode, Ellie begins with an acknowledgement of country before she tells us about her interesting and unique background as a town planner and her current work with her consultancy, Zion Engagement and Planning, as well as her passion for bringing First Nations perspectives to planning. Ellie then tells us what drew her into the town planning profession, what a smart community means to her, then discusses some of the projects she's been working on, including a career highlight working on the Western Sydney Aerotropolis project. We then discuss the importance of asking questions and having an open-minded approach when working on projects. We finish our chat discussing the emerging trend of First Nations knowledge and the value it can add to projects. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Ellie. How are you today? So good. Nice to be here. I am so excited to have you. So let's just jump straight in. And can you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about? Sure. So before I start, I'd like to just acknowledge country. I am on the land of the Nyambal people of the Bundjalung Nation in Ballina. I firstly want to just pay my respects to the people who have been very affected by flooding in this area. It's currently raining again and there's like all of these warnings for more water. So yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge just what the community is going through up here and yeah, just send a lot of strength, particularly to the mob at Cabbage Tree Island. Like they were really affected. It's like a discreet Aboriginal community not far from here. And I just like to give them a bit of a shout out and send my strength to them in the rebuild and moving forward. So my name is Ellie Davidson. I'm a Ballangara woman from the East Kimberley. I was born on Gadigal country in Sydney and have lived on Bundjalung country on and off uh, since I was eight. So I am a qualified town planner and I have my own training and consulting company called Zion Engagement and Planning. And I'm an Aboriginal planning lecturer with the University of Sydney. It's a very long title, lots of words. But essentially, I am really passionate about bringing First Nations perspectives to planning. Uh, I think that there is a lot to learn because effectively, First Nations people were the first planners on this country. They had thousands of years of experience in how to engage with country, understanding the different systems of weather, where you should or shouldn't have certain uses. And I think that there is a lot for us to really learn from and be inspired by. So my sort of passion is about empowering First Nations voices who uh, can help projects listen to country and understand the context of place to really help inform better decision making for everybody. 
Yeah, amazing. And how did you come to be a town planner? What really drew you to that profession? Yeah, that's a good question. So my stepdad was a counsellor with Byron Shire when I was a teenager. And I remember having conversations with him about like how the planners used to present at their council meetings and like the types of things that they were involved in. And then in year 11, we had to do this like leadership project where we had to sort of come up with some sort of we were in the environment group and so we had to try and figure out something that we could do for the environment and at the time the Gold Coast City Council had a like design competition about what to do with the indie pit stop for like nine months of the year that it wasn't being used and I remember sort of being in a group of like students and we came up with this kind of idea about how to do some temporary placemaking at the pit stop. And I was like, who gets to do this? This is amazing. Like I love the creativity and the collaboration. And then also like I've obviously always been very passionate about uh, justice and, you know, country and like people. So yeah, I suppose felt like a really good fit. I feel grateful that, you know, in year 11, I kind of had some instinct towards a career pathway. But I suppose like one of the other things that I love about planning is that it is so diverse. So, you know, like I did a lot of time with development assessment in my early career, and then I went to urban design, more development assessment. And then I really focused in on engagement, which then kind of, yeah, I suppose developed into a First Nations focus. But yeah, I feel like I've had like three or four different careers within planning and they all are connected and I feel as though I've learned a lot and grown a lot of skills. So yeah, I think like even back then I felt as though it was something that, you know, could have, I could have a lifelong career in and that's probably Mm -hmm. something that really attracted me to it. Yeah, I love that. And the impact that you can have as well. I'm not a planner, but I'm a planner adjacent and I have lots of planning friends. But yeah, just I think having that impact is is something that's really um, important. And, and, you know, I think a lot of planners kind of go into it because of that. So yeah, thanks for sharing. Now, we'll go broad because I'm really keen to talk about some of the projects and things you do uh, and how you do them. But let's go to what is a smart community to you? Yeah, look, I think that You know, for me, I feel like I have a lot of conversations about how, like, First Nations people, like, how we used to live and what it used to be like. And I don't think anyone has aspirations for going back backwards. Like, none of us are going to fully release ourselves from engaging in a contemporary society. And for me, that includes the benefits of technology and what it looks and feels like to be living in this day and age. But I think for me, it's about harnessing like what technology can do for us as a platform, but also making sure that it's like people focused. And I think that sometimes in this space, unfortunately, like people can be taken out of the equation. And so I think it's about kind of like recentering our thinking around how we can make technology work for us rather than the other way around. Because, yeah, sometimes it can be a little bit dehumanized. And, you know, I feel like it's really difficult sometimes thinking about our future and like going, like, we don't want to like turn into robots and we don't want to like take the people out of what our future could look like because, you know, so much more is being like automated. But I think it's about trying to figure out ways to bring people back into the center of placemaking and thinking about our future whilst also i suppose harnessing the tools that we have in our hands yeah great answer and i think in terms of planning that's why we need planners in this space because it's not just about oh well what's the new technology we can sell to the people or what's the latest widget but it's about placemaking creating great places for people and what can technology and data actually do for us but also new ways of thinking and new ways of thinking includes just new ways of engaging with people and bringing people's voices to the table that weren't there before or didn't think that they needed to be or whoever was making the decisions because we know now that and particularly in Australia there's an opportunity to input into the future of what our communities look like and and obviously different places approach that in a different way but I think for me, one of the parts about being a smart community is really empowering citizens to be able to do that. And citizens probably, you know, whatever that word is, but the community to actually bring in their ideas and think that they have a voice at the table, I think is really important. So yeah, no, I I think 
not just thinking about what tech and data can do, but how do we make great places is really key, which, yeah, we love planners. We need them in our, in this conversation. Let's talk about some of the projects and things that you've been working on. Tell us about some of the favorites. And I mean, even, I mean, obviously we've been talking online for a while and we've, we've got you on the podcast now, which we're super excited about. So whether there's been any change also in the last couple of years that you've seen working in this space, kind of two questions. So tell us about some of your favorite projects and things that you've been working on. And then maybe we can talk about some of the change you've seen in the work that you do in the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I can probably answer them at the same time because I feel Sounds great. grateful that there is a lot of change happening, like the conversations that I'm involved in or the projects that I'm involved in wouldn't have existed a couple of years ago because of how quickly things are evolving. And yeah, I feel it's just a really interesting time to be in this role because I think that a lot of people are starting to understand the value that First Nations knowledges can bring to decisions about planning or infrastructure. We're obviously also kind of seeing a deeper commitment to, I suppose, protecting cultural values within the landscape. And so that means that we have to kind of shift the way that we think about working with First Nations people and trying to bring them in a lot earlier into the project. So I suppose one of the things that I'm super passionate about is the training that we've developed. It was all kind of based from COVID happening and everybody going online. Also a deep desire of mine to be able to move back to Bundjalung country that I feel specifically connected to. And so we've developed these three modules of training, which is about working with country, community and culture. And they're for professionals in the built environment. And essentially, they help to foster a conversation to increase people's cultural capacity when it comes to working with country, community and culture. So I think for me, like that's been a really big, like it's not like a project in a specific location. It's more about contributing to the kind of online learning environment where professionals can come in and have really open and safe conversations about the things that they should be thinking about and understanding concepts like cultural landscapes and what embedding culture into the built environment looks like and and how to manage working with community and what that looks and feels like. So I think for me, that's probably been one of my, yeah, biggest like projects or a key kind of success of the last couple of years. And I suppose it's really kind of based on the fact that there is such a growing interest in, you know, really understanding what people's individual responsibility is to those considerations in the work that they do uh, in the built environment. And then also, like I suppose within that space, we share a lot about the different projects that we're working on. Probably a key highlight for me was the continued work that we've been doing with the Aerotropolis, which is all around the Western Sydney airport. So in 2020, uh, in the, at the start of COVID, we did a whole range of engagement for the Western Sydney Aerotropolis. So that's all of the the land that sits around the airport. So I continued working with GHD as a project partner. It was the first kind of project that I did under Zion. And we engaged with a whole host of Western Sydney Aboriginal communities to understand what their future aspirations were for that place. And then as we continued working with the client, we then had the opportunity to develop a chapter for the development control plan. So it was really translating what we heard from the community into a chapter that developers would need to respond to in their applications within the uh, Aerotropolis. And then because we know that this is a very new space and it's a very uh, different consideration, I suppose, for professionals in the built environment, we also developed a guideline that was called Recognise Country. And that really was to help support people understanding what their responsibilities were in responding to the development control plan. So within that, we had a section on working with cultural landscapes and understanding cultural landscapes. So so going beyond just a site-specific assessment, but how does your site connect in at a broader scale and not just considering heritage as tangible heritage. So the archaeological findings, you know, this demonstrates that Aboriginal people were here, but 
thinking more broadly about how that part of country was used and how people connected to it. And then there's a section and then also like a more natural response to waterway management and not kind of just looking at using big concrete drains. So lots of kind of ways to respond to to country. We also have a section in there about the built uh, form. So ways that buildings could be designed to be a lot more responsive to country and embed uh, knowledge into the design of a building. Things like cultural infrastructure being integrated into places and spaces for people. And then there's also a section on language and naming. So making sure that First Nations uh, language is embedded into the future of the Aerotropolis. So that's probably like, I don't know, it's it's probably been one of, yeah, my career highlights, absolutely, because it feels like it's just a combination of all of the things that I love and the skill set that I've developed with my development, like DA assessment experience, working with communities, you know, that kind of problem solving and also kind of, I suppose, helping to guide the future of planning outcomes. So that's probably like my key highlight. And a lot of the other work that I've been doing kind of centers around that project. Yeah. Wow. That's a huge piece and a really important piece. So congratulations on that. I mean, I did a little bit of work in Western Sydney as well. So we know how much, you know, how much is happening there and how much is changing. And that will be such a pivotal piece in the future of that community. So, yeah, I think that's amazing. So thanks for sharing that too, because I think also sometimes we might not, you know, it's not super sexy to have a guideline or to have, you know, this, but actually making sure that people can speak that, that you're communicating with people in something that they can understand so that it can integrate into the future is really important too, because sometimes people just, they haven't thought about it because they haven't engaged in that way before or, they don't understand how to do it. So, you know, it doesn't happen because it's it seems too hard in inverted commas. So I think making it as easy as possible and accessible as possible for not, you know, for the people working on it, but then also everybody now understands or not necessarily understands, but everyone has something to kind of go to and then who else to talk to as well? Because as we know, we can't have, you know, we need to have so many people at the the table so then we can continue to ask questions and see how that kind of moves into that, how that like really translates into the future of of what they're doing there um, because there's so much happening too. Yeah, I mean, as you said, maybe not like sexy, but at the same time really necessary, you know, because people just don't really know where to turn. There's no other kind of like Australian standards or things that people can kind of go to for more direction like you see in a lot of development control plans that lack a lot of the stuff that gets pointed towards is that other policies or other standards or other ways of um, meeting the requirements. And because this is such a new space, we really felt that the guidelines, you know, they help to pose really important questions like have you considered these Mm -hmm. things or, you know, just making sure that the project team are responsive to the things that might relate to their project whilst trying to keep it as broad as possible. So it was a very fine balance to kind of navigate through all of that. But yeah, as a team, we're certainly really proud of the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think having a place to turn, but then also like integrating, I guess the lessons learned as well, I imagine is something that, you know, moving forward, like it, it will be, you know, obviously this is for the Western Sydney Aerotropolis component, but then can that translate into other areas, the, the common themes or whatever translate into other areas and make it more contextual to different spaces or in different country around Australia as well? Yeah. Yeah, look, there's definitely, in working with the Western Sydney Planning Partnership, we always had the intent that whatever we created had to be bespoke and relevant to that particular part of country. But the concepts and the principles were definitely something that we could see being applied at a much broader scale because they're the same kinds of questions that everybody should be asking and the answers are going to be different because you're going to be working with different people, you're going to be working with different country. But, yeah, I suppose for us it was we worked with a great team of people who were all really passionate about trying to get the best kind of outcome but we did have that foresight in kind of I suppose knowing that it was going to be applicable beyond just the area that we were looking at so yeah it's really exciting I think that there's been some really great conversations with other clients and you know had a group of people through from the Victorian 
uh, planning authority and into the training. And they went and had a look at the document and came back and said, you know, it was quite useful. And, you know, they were really curious about how it could apply to the work that they're doing. So could definitely see it going wider and, and more broadly. Mm. And something you said is so important in, in smart communities, but in any project and, and then definitely in just moving forward for the future is asking questions. And what I love when you said that is asking questions with the answers will be different based on the, you know, the country that you're in or the context that you're ask, asking those questions in. And that's also really key because we don't necessarily, sometimes we ask questions thinking we know the answer to, just we need to, we need to ask the question, but actually it'll all be different. But those questions are so uh, important and, and they're the things that, you know, a docu- or, you know, a guideline or whatever can prompt us to make sure that we ask. And then we learn that and then we make sure we ask those on the next project and, and things like that. And then we continue to learn based on those answers to the questions too. Totally. I mean, it's kind of one of the things that I, you know, when people talk to me about like engaging with First Nations communities and like things that they should think about. And yeah, one of my first and uh, immediate responses is to, you know, go with an open mind, like don't go in with assumptions around like what people's responses are going to be or, you know, like it's important to do your research up front. So making sure that you're like going and, and sourcing any like reports that are being written or any archival evidence or responses you know just to I think that we all have a responsibility to do our homework because there is a lot that exists out there but at the same time you never know who you're talking to and what their response is going to be to the things that you find as well so you know I think saying like I found this from what I've read or you know what are your thoughts around this certain topic? It's it's really helpful to go not with like a full kind of very low base level, but also you never know people's interaction with the particular things that you've read. So it's also important not to go like this is the this is what is said and this is the evidence and now we're going to go down this path of conversation. So yeah, I always mm-hmm. try to encourage people to be prepared, but also be open because you never know what kind of conversations you're going to have and the particular perspective that that person is going to have towards the things that you've read. So just keeping an open mind and not necessarily feeling like, you know, you want it to be a conversation. What's the point going out there and being like, I've got all the answers because I've read all of these things or I've spoken to you mob on this other project. Like, it's just a waste of time if you're going in with that kind of posture and attitude. So yeah, I suppose it's something that I always try to be intentional about is being open, asking questions, being prepared, but at the same time, just allowing the conversation to flow and let them lead Mm. rather than feeling like I've got this whole set of questions and all of these things I need to get to, because that might not actually lead to where they want to take the conversation. Yeah. Asking, you know, the one question, but then seeing where that goes, based on the answer and and really what is it that they want to tell you and what is it really important to them maybe you know it's it's the pain points they want to tell you but also maybe the really great things that they don't want to lose and and things like that so yeah I think that's so that's so important and and the open mind is obviously so important too in all those conversations that we have because yeah as soon as we think we have any of the answers and moving forward but being prepared and doing your homework too is key because obviously we don't want to be having you know they may have told the five consultants before the same thing over and over again. Like we already wrote, you know, we already, you read this report, they've done that, whatever it is, else it is. But then, yeah, really thinking about what else is really key and from the different people involved. Absolutely. And I think it's also why it's important to seek permission to share who has been involved in the writing of reports. Like I always try to attribute people's, you know, name to things where possible because then it means the next person who's reading that knows that that person was involved in that process and so therefore you can say I've read this report I know you were involved and you can sort of build from that so yeah there's a real balance in all of that but I always always say to people that consultation fatigue isn't necessarily just about the amount of meetings it's about groundhog day for knowledge holders and custodians and then really just having to rehash the same conversation at a really basic level rather than going, you know, I've just read all of these reports. I'm really keen to build on these particular aspects. Is there anything else that I should know about these reports that wasn't in there? 
And also like, you know, I want to talk about implementing these things. Like let's go to that next step so that I'm honoring your time and the contribution you've already made towards this issue or this part of country. And it's just a really, you always, it's such a great way of building respect and honor because they can see that you're really genuine and that you, you're you not there to kind of, you know, waste people's time. You actually want to kind of build on and yeah, use what's happened as a foundation. And I think everybody's really respectful of that. No, I love that. It's such, yeah, it's so important. I'm just looking at time. I'm, I think we're going to have to zoom to the future now. So I think that kind of gives us a good stepping stone to the future. What are the emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough? Look, I think that it's probably going full circle to what I shared at the start or what inspired me into this career. I feel like First Nations people have so much to add value to your project, to your team. You know, like obviously there's this increase in interest in like working with First Nations people, but like is it gen- is it just a ticket box just to say that we've done it or do you genuinely value and respect First Nations knowledge enough to make sure that it's like embedded into your project plan. So it's not just at these particular points we're going to go out and engage. It's like identifying partners that can work with you very early in the piece so that they can feel as though their voices are empowered throughout the whole process. And that's probably the thing that I'm sort of seeing change and shift is like evolving from like consultation and engagement to partnership. What does that look like? You know, Dylan Combermary from the Government Architects talks about that a lot and the Connecting with Country framework is really built on the foundation of, you know, partnership with community and really empowering voices throughout all phases but then also into the future, the implementation of these decisions. What does it look like for First Nations people to be deeply embedded into these environments, into the future? Now, that can be, you know, through a range of things, you know, in terms of the way that people move through country, the uses of different country, the design of buildings, but then also like how are First Nations people employed, how are we making sure that they have housing in these places, that their communities can continue to live in these places into the future because a lot with a lot of, you know, these big planning projects, a lot of First Nations people are kind of locked out into being there in the future. And so, you know, for me, it's not just about like the visual representation and a very embedded response to that, but it's also about seeing Aboriginal people in these places in the future and what that really looks like and feels like. So I think for me, when it comes about back to the things that people aren't talking about. It's like, what is the value add of partnering with communities? Like, it's not just about doing a feel good engagement, but like, what are we open to learning? How are we open to allowing that to like impact the project to a point where it's a very integrated partnership with our team? And really, I suppose, yeah, just thinking about working with community very differently. Yeah, I think it's a great and trend isn't the word, but it's something that definitely needs more more focus and seeing that change in the you know from your experience seeing that change and shift and then hopefully yeah we'll continue in the future and really that's what smart community pro and you know we talk about technology and data but it's also about new ways of thinking and maybe it's not necessarily new ways of thinking but doing things differently because we know that we need to change if we want a different outcome for the future and. I think, yeah, that's really a key point in engagement and that it's not just a, yeah, like a tick and flick box of, oh, yep, we all feel good now, we all high five, we talk to people once, but how do we co-create together? And, and again, bit buzzword, bit buzzword bingo there, but just bringing people along the journey and, and really that partnership, going from consultation and engagement to partnerships. And I really like that. Uh, I think that that's really important. Well, Ellie, it's been so great to have you on the podcast. Thank you again for spending some time with me this morning, uh, this afternoon rather. It's, I can't believe it's afternoon already. But no, I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and sharing the projects and things you'll be working on. And hopefully we can all learn something from the those nuggets of gold that you shared with us. So thank you again for joining me on the podcast. Thank you very much. Up here we say boogle bear, which means thank you. See you next time. So yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Ellie. I just have one last question, which is how can people connect with you? Sure. 
I think that LinkedIn is probably the best way to find me. So it's L-E-E-L-L-E. I know L, I don't know what my mom was thinking. Davidson, uh, our website is being updated at the moment. So uh, I'm apprehensive to send you there, but there is information about Zion. So it's Zion, Z-I-O-N-E-P.com.au. I'm looking forward to that website being updated really soon. Excellent. Well, thanks again for coming. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye. Are you looking for an engaging speaker, MC, or facilitator for your next big event? Then we've got you covered. Zoe is a go-to speaker, MC, and conversation facilitator with a difference. She's a master at simplifying the complex and making connections you might never see. Book Zoe for your next event. Email hello at mysmart.community or head over to her speaker page, www.mysmart.community forward slash speaking. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes, so thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.